very embodiment of Chinese thinking. His enthronement was conducted strictly according to traditional Confucian custom. This, in modern terms, was very good public relations. It meant the revival of dozens of traditional ceremonies that had not been performed at court for many years. In choosing the name Yuan for his dynasty, Kublai also turned to Confucian principles. The word Yuan has powerful connotations, for in the Confucian book, the I Ching, it means the origins of the universe. Kublai had united all of China, from the foothills of Burma to Manchuria, under a single dynasty, a single lord. By proclaiming the Yuan dynasty, Kublai gave every impression of having forsaken Mongol life, but it was not so. Behind a screen of Confucian ceremonies, Kublai established an order of racial precedence. The most important positions were held by Mongols, and the most lowly by the southern Chinese. Kublai constructed a centralized Mongol authority of three divisions. First, a secretariat, responsible for all civil matters. Second, a privy council, responsible for all military matters. And third, a censorate, a vast army of spies that traveled the country for the purpose of preventing rebellions. So, while these large outdoor rituals continued, the Chinese were encouraged to believe that life was as it had always been, in harmony with nature. But Kublai's motives were not entirely cynical. He did care about the well-being of the people who made up the most important part of the empire. The new emperor introduced tax exemptions for those trying to rebuild their homes. He built granaries, irrigation systems, and reclaimed land. He even passed a law preventing Mongols from grazing their horses on farming land. Surprising indeed from a grandson of Genghis Khan. But if the economy was to emerge from the gloom of war, it needed more than just prosperous agriculture. By nationalizing all the gold and silver mines throughout China, like this one, which dates from his time, Kublai set out to establish a government-controlled economy based around a large central exchequer. The mining or hoarding of all precious metals was forbidden. They were to be a state monopoly. From across the country, precious ore and even silver coins were transported under guard to the new state-operated mints. Here, the ore was melted down and turned into imperial ingots. Soon, a vast reserve of silver was produced in a variety of weights, each stamped with the official imperial mark. Kublai had effectively created a silver standard. Against these reserves, Kublai printed paper notes, which were distributed throughout the land in return for coins or silver. So, in a nation of over 50 million people, there was one official currency, and it was Kublai's. His was probably the first administration in the world to have what amounted to a central bank and a semi-planned economy. Kublai also knew that the key to a strong economy, then as now, was through production and trade. Chinese ceramics were greatly valued abroad, so he encouraged the establishment of potteries all across the south, near the great seaports. Kublai, the grandson of a nomadic horseman, 
issued licenses to every factory. He did everything he could to encourage production. Soon the countryside was shrouded in smoke from the hundreds of kilns that worked day and night to keep up supply. While artisans produced pottery, silks, silverware, carpets, furniture and armaments, Kublai built a massive merchant fleet to carry them right around the Orient. He was great Khan of half the world, and he would take every advantage of it. His fleets, captained by skilled navigators, traded right across Southeast Asia to India, and even as far west as the Persian Gulf. Here in particular, in the cities of the Ilkhanate, Chinese pottery was always in demand. But it was the trade of ideas and technology that made this sea link so important. Here, in the Gulf, Chinese merchants made a valuable discovery. The Persian artisans had developed a number of important new ceramic dyes. The most famous was cobalt. After it had been ground into a thin paste, the Persians used it to coat mud bricks before they were fired. In the kiln, this dull grey finish was transformed into a radiant blue and the local builders were using these thick tiles to clad the outside of their domed buildings. In China, the cobalt, imported from the Persian Gulf, was used to produce the most delicate patterns. Under Kublai, Chinese potters were given free reign. They could illustrate any subject, as long as it was about hunting and horses. It was during this period that the first blue-white glazes were produced, the very best of Chinese pottery. It was a two-way trade. Chinese techniques soon influenced Persian artists. Buildings were decorated in ever more complex ceramics, and their designs reflected the Oriental influence. Though he never knew it, Kublai could take much of the credit. Kublai understood that trade across the breadth of Asia could be the means of binding the empire together. He poured fortunes into any number of projects to encourage trade. He expanded the great harbor here at Hangchow, and each year thousands of ships were guided through the straits by a lighthouse near the mouth of the inner harbor. The old Song capital became the most important trading center in the world. Against the wishes of his Chinese advisors, Kublai encouraged foreigners to come to his new China. Persian merchants from the Ilkhanate arrived, built trading houses, villas, and of course, mosques. Islam spread along the coastal cities, side by side with Hinduism, which arrived with merchants and craftsmen from the subcontinent. Arabs from the Gulf, Turks from Asia Minor, Russians from the Golden Horde. For the first time in her history, China was inundated with foreign cultures. The Mongol policy of religious tolerance under Kublai saw the spread of alien religions. And when the Pope agreed to establish an archbishopric in China, Kublai hailed it as evidence that his empire really was universal and China was at the center of it. But it was Kublai's links with the great Italian city-states, and in particular Venice, that demonstrated his true internationalism. 
the Venetians had traded in Oriental cargoes for years, but only through Persian middlemen.